Well, last week we looked at Philemon. Um, We're just looking at a couple of short books in the next few weeks. And uh, we talked about how Philemon calls us to be an example of the gospel by extending forgiveness. Uh, This week we're going to look at the book of Jude. Uh, It is only 619 words long. So I'm going to read the letter of Jude to you this morning. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our Lord into a license for for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their position of authority but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual morality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand, and what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain, They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way, all of all the harsh words and and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instinct and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Okay, did you follow all of that? If uh, at some point in me reading Jude, your ears didn't go, what? Then you weren't paying close enough attention. He uses stories from the Old Testament to pull in an understanding that this audience would have had. 
Lessons like uh, Israel's rebellion against God after being redeemed from Israel. He references fallen angels, the archangel Michael in some sort of battle against uh, the devil over the body of Moses. Um, and honestly, there's a whole lot of stuff in there that makes me go, what? Because I don't know where he's pulling it from. But he says Enoch prophesied, so okay, I'll just move on. The reality is, if I were to get lost in those things, I would miss the point of Jude. Sometimes I think we confuse um, things that sound deeply profound as though they're meat, when in fact they're not. Enoch prophesying and where that's found, this uh, angels, these falling and being bound up in chains, this dispute between the archangel Michael and the devil over the body of Moses. So what? The message is, if you reject the word of the Lord, destruction comes upon you. That's the meat. Everything else is just an example. He's only trying to reference stories that we should know as warnings against rejecting the word of God, the true gospel delivered through Jesus Christ. So none of that holds my imagination. So what do I do with the book of Jude? Well, there was something that perked my interest. It's right here in the third verse. He says, I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share. I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Jude is written to remind us what it is we believe. He just doesn't spell it all out. He writes to remind us that the faith has been entrusted to us. And this faith, he says, is in the one true sovereign and only Savior, Jesus Christ. He's reminding us of what it is we believe, what we gather here and celebrate. The reality that through the death of Jesus, his blood shed upon the cross, you and I are saved. That's how we're made right with God. That it is a gift of God. That the grace of Jesus is extended to anyone who is willing to call upon the name of Jesus and proclaim him Lord. That God, through Jesus, is redeeming humanity. It's a simple message, but it's deep, deeply profound because we believe that God has once for all dealt with sin and death in Jesus. It's why we gather around the table and we remember the death of Jesus, his burial, his resurrection, and we proclaim it waiting for his return because we believe this is the most profound and deeply meaningful way to celebrate what God has done. He has extended forgiveness to humanity. What's interesting is that Jude says, I wanted to talk about that because that's what's really important. But there's something more pressing and he has to take the opportunity to tell us something else. Not just a reminder of the grace that we've experienced through Jesus Christ, but he says, I needed to ask you to contend for the faith. Have you been watching the Olympics at all? We, we put it on in our house, and then there seems to be this rallying point where the family all comes in and watches whenever Michael Phelps is on the screen. Contending is this word that means to fight, to compete for, to pursue, to give it your all. At 31 years of age, Michael Phelps is an example of contending, isn't he? Swimming against guys 10 years younger, and yet winning. Jude says he needs to remind us that we're supposed to be contending for the faith. Now, what do you suppose he means? 
It's a lot of silence now. If we're going to fight for the faith, we better recognize what we're up against. And then he draws attention to these false teachers, where all these stories he references really quickly to remind us what their future is. Destruction. The reality of this letter is, Jude is telling us, do you remember the message of the apostles? That he, they said at one point, these false teachers were going to come out and they were going to be dividing the church. They were going to be um, putting in messages that were going to be the destruction. That would be their destruction and the destruction of anyone that followed. Jude is actually written to you and me because we live in that era. You see, we live after the ministry of Jesus. We live after the death of Jesus. We live after the message and the ministry of the apostles, the spread of the faith around the world. We live before the return of Jesus. So we live in the midst of the era that Jude is talking about. False teachers who come in and pervert the gospel. I want to be this is really fun. I'm looking at Ivory. Ivory, I get to preach a message about false teachers drawing attention to myself, and so there's a great risk here, isn't there? I have to make sure I'm saying the truth, because if I don't, I become one of the false teachers. Here's the thing, church. There's a lot of people in the world today that want to diminish the gospel of Jesus. It's quite simple. Their goal is to detract from the message of Jesus, to say, don't look at that anymore. It doesn't matter what they're preaching. It doesn't matter what they're selling. It doesn't matter what culture, race, religion, or anything they're coming from. If their message is, don't pay any attention to Jesus, they're in the false teacher category. Because they're trying to say that the gospel, the ministry, the life of Jesus isn't significant. Do you know what I'm talking about? In a world that wants to say, how do you please God? Well, you just be good. No. Do you know how you please God? Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died upon the cross for my sin, who was buried and raised and lives forever. That glorifies God. That's how you please God. You don't please God by keeping a record of all the good things that you've done for Him. You, it won't work. It doesn't matter how many things you've done that were selfless. You cannot make yourself pleasing to God with those things. That was a very hard message for the Israelites, the Jews, to accept. Because they believed that just because of who they were and where they had come from and who their parents were, that set them in the right relationship with God. And then all they needed to do was follow rules. And Jesus told them, no, you have to believe in the one God has sent. There are many people who want to detract from the message of Jesus. There are people who want to tell you that you can have a fresh start, but from now on, everything counts. Do you know that's not the gospel of Jesus? Do you know what saves you? The blood of Jesus alone. What makes you right with God? The blood of Jesus alone. What guarantees eternal life for you? The Spirit of God guarantees eternal life for you. Even if you do something good, do you remember what Paul said? It isn't my good. Even if I do something good, who did it? It is God in me who produces good. How does God save you? It's all His work. Everything that happens is God's work. Now, there's another thing I have to mention here. 
a fundamental teaching of false prophets. You can do anything you want because the grace of God covers all sin. I'm going to be taken out of context now. Somebody's going to download this on YouTube and they're going to play it and say that I said you can do anything because the grace of God covers you. That is a lie. You can't. The blood of Jesus isn't a license to sin. And Jude confronts that. And our world needs to hear it. Our world is in an era where they believe that their own personal values, what they believe to be true, is fine. And that's the only standard they have to live up to. That is a lie. We have a creator. You and I believe we have a creator. And if there is a creator, he is in charge. And his expectation for his creation is what should be met. Our values, when we say Jesus Christ is Lord, our personal values, our personal beliefs are surrendered. We are obedient only to the Lord. And these men were in rebellion against the teaching of Jesus. False prophets want you to believe that whatever you think is right for you. And it's not. I want to mention here, God's rules are not arbitrary. God's expectations for his creation are not just something he came up with just because he wanted to. The reality is that from the very beginning, God understands something you and I don't. The destruction, the destructive power of sin. And God can't stand for you to be hurt by it anymore. I wish there was some simple way for me to explain this. When I talk to my students, I remind them of uh, something that happened a very long time ago in my life. I've experienced it with almost every single one of my children. Are you aware the stove is hot? My kids would walk into the kitchen. Sean would be making yummy treats or cookies or something for them. The stove is hot. And they would naturally migrate over to the beautiful glowing light that held the magic treats. And they want to touch it. All three of my children were snatched from the terrible, mean, awful, evil stove. There's nothing wrong with the stove. There's something wrong with the damage that it can do. Because when something is perverted, when something is changed from the way that God has intended it to be, it enters the realm of sin. And we would snatch our children and tell them no. There was even a couple of incidents, I'm willing to admit, of a smacked hand. Not because I'm an evil, violent, terrible human being, but because I know how much damage the stove can do. My children did not. If you want to understand why God says, don't do this, it's not because you're going to hurt him. It's not going to cause the universe unending damage. It's not going to unravel the mysteries of salvation. It's not even going to lead to Jesus being put on the cross. That's been done. You are going to be hurt. I guarantee if you flirt with the fire, you're going to be hurt. And every single person, especially the ones with the gray hair on the top of their head, they can tell you the pain that sin weaves into the lives of people. How people end up slaves, unable to do what they really want in life because they're addicted, they're trapped, they're stuck. 
in their own mind because that's what sin produces. And God says, don't do that. If you want to come and ask me for the list, I'll refer you to some people who can tell you. But I would never finish talking if I had to tell you everything in the world that leads to destruction. The list is so long that what God tried to do in Jesus was something different. He invited you to live like Jesus. Not get up in the morning and start your checklist. I didn't do that, I didn't do that, I didn't do that. But instead, to ask yourself, what are you doing that leads to life and blessing and joy and peace? God has, through Jesus, invited us into life. Not simply staying away from death. That's the whole point. Our world is full of people who want to convince you that the message of Jesus isn't inclusive enough. It's not welcoming enough. It's not um, embracing of cultures and varieties of beliefs. The message of Jesus is absolutely the most inclusive message there has ever been. All have sinned. All fall short. All begin in the same place. And all are saved through one thing. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But we have been convinced to stay quiet because we might be offensive to some. How can the love of God be offensive? But you and I live in an era where we're told our message is offensive. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we are told that it's offensive. And so in so many ways, we have stopped contending for the faith. It's just where we live. We've neglected the responsibility that we have. Because the faith hasn't been entrusted to a whole bunch of angels. The faith has been entrusted to the saints, to the church, to you. The faith has been entrusted to you. And don't get lost in all the tangents. Hold simply to the faith we profess. Jesus Christ is Lord. With everything that we have, we must contend for that message. Grace is found in Jesus. Forgiveness is found in Jesus. Hope is found in Jesus. Righteousness is found in Jesus. Every blessing that you want is found in Jesus. There is no other name that you can call upon and receive the blessing of God. It's a simple message of faith. There's one more thing that Jude wrote that I think is important for us to hear again. God is able to sustain you. Did you know that? He's able to bring victory into your life. Did you know that? 
He is able to defeat whatever challenge lies before you. Regardless of circumstance, God is able to defeat it. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory majesty power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore amen we serve the only one worthy. The only one. And when we gather here and we proclaim, Jesus died for you. He was buried in a tomb and he rose three days later. He lives so that you can have eternal life. It's the message that we believe is the most pressing. And if you have never claimed Jesus Christ as Lord, if you've never invited the forgiveness of God, the presence of the power of God into your life, into the circumstances that hold you back, this is the opportunity that you have to take hold of what God is doing. And if you're a believer and you know that you have allowed yourself to be distracted from the simple message of Jesus, that hope is found in Him, that He alone can sustain you, then come forward and let us encourage your heart today by praying in the Holy Spirit for you to find the strength you need. Let's stand together and sing.